Yes, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Vincent. So um, I am at the, uh, in the Media and Technology Group of what is now known as CMS Cameron McKenna de Borough, Oswang LLP. Some of you may have been familiar with us in our previous guise as Oldswang uh, before we merged on the 1st of May. Um, what, what are we now? Well, we are a global law firm um, with a interestingly turquoise slide uh, originally uh, with a thousand, um, a thousand plus partners, four and a half thousand lawyers, uh, 16 ranked media lawyers in the UK. Uh, so we kind of think we know what we're doing with this stuff. Um, and we are spending most, a lot of time at the moment worrying about um, GDPR. I'm going to take you through really from a very practical perspective. Uh, we do have a 99-point action plan for things you need to do in order to become GDPR uh, compliant, although, to be honest, that is better than um, the client who a few weeks ago shared with us the 63-page questionnaire that they'd received from another law firm uh, who was kind of doing this from a, from a top-down HQ level, and they kind of went, does, does that mean us? And we went, mm, yeah, okay. So, um, I'm going to try and give you the headlines, why you need to worry about it um, and what you need to do based on a few questions. So first question, uh, we can leave this all to our European people to worry about. We don't we go and set ourselves up in Mexico or the US or wherever that may be. Um, because if you look at the current rules, you only have to comply with European data protection rules if you're carrying out the processing, either in the context of the controller being based in the EU or the processing activity being in the EU. But under GDPR, you will be caught if you are processing personal data um, in the context of somebody ru running a business, whether or not that processing happens in Europe, and wherever you are in the world, if you are processing data relating to the offering of goods or services to data subjects, even if no payment, or monitoring their behavior in the EU. So that kind of means everything and everyone, okay? So if you, if you are doing anything with personal data, which is the next question, involving people from the EU, you know, if you are involved in offering goods or services, well, I have to say that um, serving an ad on someone is, is almost inevitably involved in the offering of goods or services um, or, and or monitoring their behavior, whatever you're doing, you are going to be caught. Uh, what is personal data? Well, that's easy, isn't it? It's data about people. Well, yeah, you might think that, but actually, no, ne never that easy, is it? So it's any information which relates to an identified or identifiable natural person. So you don't actually need to know who somebody is. If you have enough information, then uh, that will take you into the into the loop, even if you don't don't actually know who you're serving an ad to. So, you know, if you've got a single item of data, you know you're delivering, for example, to a male who's 1634. That's probably not enough to be personal data. But how many attributes do you need to get to before you have personal data? It's male 16 to 34, sympathetic to charities. Cambridge based, a vet, a frequent traveler, a graduate. How many of those things, how much of that information before you suddenly tick the box and you have personal data? Um, what do you have to do? Well, there are a whole bunch of things you need to do. Um, it is the biggest paperwork generating exercise um, and therefore work generating exercise for lawyers that anyone has generated for a very long time. And part of it is about, you don't need just to be compliant, you need to be seen to be compliant. So you have to have appropriate technical me measures to be able to demonstrate that you are compliant. You have to have policies, you have to follow codes of conduct and certification if those exist in your sector. Um, you have to be able to demonstrate that when you built your systems and networks and processes, you thought about privacy. These things at the bottom, you talk about privacy impact assessments. Um, and the importance of this is, is if you can show that you've ticked all the boxes and done all of these things, 
then the chances are when it comes down to um, enforcement, you will be dealt with leniently. Um, and I think we will see a sliding scale, which is minor breach, but heavy compliance process, you'll get off with a slap on the wrist. Um, big breach, but actually pretty good at the process, you'll probably still do all right. Minor breach, sloppy process, you're going to get hammered. So it's all about what, it, what you're doing and being seen to do the right thing. Now, the other thing we always used to think and we always used to say was, well, it doesn't matter because nobody really cares about data anyway. Um, I promised Vincent a slide, which I couldn't actually find, so sorry, Vincent, um, that I used to have in a deck where um, you, we plotted the percentage of the, of the uh, populations of various countries on Facebook to the level of data privacy rights available in those territories. Because if people cared about data, you would have thought that countries that have high data compliance, um, you would have more people signing up. But places with low data compliance, you know, people would be worried about signing up, and therefore they wouldn't. There's no correlation at all, OK? The country with the highest percentage of the population signed up to Facebook last time I looked was Colombia, not known for its data protection uh, regime. Um, and, and the other important thing is it doesn't matter if 99% of the audience um, don't care about data compliance. It only takes one. Um, who's heard of Mr. Schrems? Anyone heard of Schrems? Put your hand up if you heard of Mr. Schrems, other than Nick. Okay. Mr. Schrems was the guy responsible for taking down the EU-US uh, data sharing agreement. He's a pernickety law student who had a point to prove and he's now going off and proving a point by trying to attack some different legislation. Um, but it only took one of him. We ran a case about the, um, about the Safari hack uh, where, where um, Google were using data that they weren't supposed to be able to access by changing the settings in Safari. There were 12 plaintiffs in that case, um, and that was the case that led to you being able to claim damages for breach of uh, data rules. So it doesn't matter that most people just tick boxes and they don't care. The compliance, it only takes a few people to make a point. Um, so what's new? We've already got data protection laws. Data protection laws have been here for years. What's new? What do we need to do? So first of all, there's a bunch of stuff that people have already that are being tweaked. Rights of access, right of rectification, you got my name wrong, please fix it. Um, and uh, control over automated decision making and polling. But there's some new stuff coming as well. And these are the ones that are causing quite a lot of headache, particularly in terms of how you implement them through, through a complex supply chain. So you have the right to be forgotten. So the right to turn around to someone who you've given your data to and say, actually, I've changed my mind. Please erase me. Please forget me from your systems. Um, you have the right to, to, to ask people not to. Uh, you have the right to opt out of any processing activity. Say, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Now you have the right to turn around at any time and say no. The right to portability. This is, this is the, the most complicated one. Um, but broadly speaking, um, I, I, I will paraphrase with a bad example, which is, you know, I've been shopping at Amazon for 20 years, 10 years. Amazon have um, all my history about the stuff that I've bought. If I decide I don't want to shop with Amazon anymore and I want to shop with an Amazon competitor, I have the right to say to Amazon, can you give me that information in a data-readable form that I can take off to the, to the other supplier? There, there are some, some details around exactly when it applies. It's not quite as sweeping as you might think, but you need to get your head around these new rights. And they all have systems implementation implications, they have cost implications, and they have process implications. So what's the worst that could happen? Um, slap on the wrist? Well, no. Uh, and this is, this, is why, this is the only reason people care about this, which is um, potentially you have the ability, the, 
that enforcement authorities have the right to implement up to 4% fines based on worldwide turnover. It's fascinating. This was yellow on my original slide deck as well. Um, so, um, whereas today, you only have the right to get compensation for damage. So, you actually have to show that if your data has been misused, you've suffered loss in order to be able to sue. And that loss can be tangible or intangible. But in the future, there are administrative fines for doing stuff wrong. Um, and the, 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 the authorities are required to have effective, proportionate, and dissuasive penalties, right? Dissuasive means pour en corrige les autres, right? It means we are going to make an example of the first few people who come through the door uh, with data problems. Um, and again, you will see uh, increasing use of consumer groups. I mean, that already exists in places like Germany, but you will see increasing use of uh, consumer groups to come in and... Um, protect the rights of consumers uh, or be self-appointed busybodies, depending on how you look at it. So, okay, that's, that's the scare you bit. What, what are people doing about it? How, how do you get to grips with this? What are the practical things you need to do? Um, so, the first thing is audits, data mapping. You need to understand how you are using data in your business, what it's being used for, um, what data you have, how are you storing it, how is it being secured, all those sorts of things. Um, and actually, we, you know, there are ways to do it. We found that a business function-based review is the easiest way to get your heads around it for most people. So most businesses use data in a whole bunch of different things. So you have your core business, you know, whether it's ad, ad tech or whatever it is, you have IT, you have HR data, you have a whole bunch of different data. Look at each of those different business functions, how you're using data, and then apply um, the policies. Uh, you need to work through your supply chain because if you are giving data to someone else, then you now have a greater degree of responsibility for making sure that they are compliant. So you've got to push uh, contractual compliance obligations down through the supply chain. You've got to implement systems and controls. You've got to train people. And then you have to hope that you're not the person who gets the phone call from the regulator. Um, now, all of that sounds scary. The funny thing is that, in many ways, it is consistent with best practice and kind of attitudinal approach to things. So, you know, if I, if I had a pound for every time I saw a slide that used the expression privacy by design in the last two years, then, um, you know, being more consumer friendly, uh, being, uh, moving towards more consumer enabled data uh, interfaces where people can opt in and opt out in a more, more user-friendly way, <laughs> using data more holistically. So there is a degree of congruence between the regulatory stick and the consumer friendliness, ca consumer friendliness carrot, although the stick is at the moment probably slightly bigger than the carrot. Um, and... Uh, just the, probably the, the, the hardest one and the most important one in here is, is data spring clean. There are new higher thresholds for the obligation to get rid of data when it's no longer useful or where it's no longer covered by a consent. Um, trying to persuade businesses to throw data away is really hard. It's really hard. Um, um, and we will see data protection being used as a brand proposition. Um, People like the idea of going, we're, we're good people. Some, some, some businesses, anyway. Um, so you have kind of this type of, you know, our privacy policy, the Guardian, um, you know, trying to make this user-friendly, uh, opt-in, uh, we're going to cookies, uh, real-time real -time, uh, messages. So you click on the email box, so we use your email, you know, Please follow this link. So, so um, 
trying to make these things user friendly and, and sort of built into the normal contracting processes. Um, so that was that was really all I wanted to say ahead of the panel. Um, the takeaway point I'll leave you with is is optics are important. Um, if you get caught having breached the rules, and frankly, you know everyone is going to be at risk because no one is going to be at no one is going to be perfect. You just need to make sure that you have an acceptable level of risk. The optics are really important to be able to demonstrate to the regulator, to the consumers, that uh, you have at least tried to tick all the boxes, even if at the end of the day you fall down. Thank you very much. So first of all, how, how will the GDPR change the media landscape? And is blockchain the silver bullet from a technology point of view. So we've heard from uh, Tim. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, we've heard from John. Um, let's hear from Tim. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself and, and yeah, who sure. you are? My name is Tim Keenan. I'm the founder of Factor, and we're a blockchain-based identity management platform. Uh, we're trying to tackle consent and ad preferences uh, for reasons we will probably get to in a few minutes. <laughs> Okay, and, and Stacey? I want to say Gavin and Stacey. But you, might, you might not get that, actually, if you're from Holland. Um, Stacey. Um, Stacey Huggins. I'm the executive director of AdLedger, which is a blockchain consortium. Um, it's based in the U.S., but we also are starting a group uh, here in the U.K. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Madhive, which is a blockchain applications company uh, in the advertising industry. Great. Okay, so, well, if the GDPR is aiming for privacy di by default, I think... John demonstrated well that it's complexity by default. Um, but let's go on to, you know, not go into the, the, the details of what the GDPR is and, 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 and what it says and what it does. Let's talk about the winners and losers, potential winners and losers. Um, a lot's been written about will it benefit the global platforms at the expense of, you know, B2B companies, agencies, ad tech. Um, will it lead to a more logged in environment we saw uh, yesterday or we heard yesterday the telegraph was approaching that um from that point of view um and of course there's been examples in germany as well so three questions all rolled into one who, who wants it stacy why don't you kick off sure so um it is a pretty complex topic but um my opinion is that it offers a lot of although it's really could be quite painful it offers a lot of opportunity for um, particularly for some of the premium publishers out there outside of, of the duopoly of Google and Facebook. So typically these premium publishers would have a lot of access to first party logged in states. Mm -hmm. And um, if they have the right permissions in place, then they have a, a better opportunity to even potentially collect more data and then use that data to their advantage in a privacy compliant way. Whereas now they typically have to rely quite a bit on third party identity graph type companies that have to help them fill in all the blanks and create more robust targeting segments. So uh, what that really means is in the grander scheme is that they're, they're essentially very much wedded to <coughs> the, the middlemen who are bringing a lot of that economic value into the center at the expense of, of either the edges. So um, it, it's a great opportunity for some of those publishers to have uh, create environments where they have a more direct relationship and have more uh, agency over their own um, their own business proposition and, and rely a bit less on some of those ad tech middlemen. So the biggest loser is going to be uh, those that are right in the middle of the supply chain. Not necessarily. I mean, if they are um, if they are also privacy compliant and they offer a great deal of value. Uh, with 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 their techno technology, then they'll still become uh, very much needed. What's what's tricky is that a lot of these large ad tech companies who work to really fill in the blanks with data, they have these legacy databases that are not organized in a way that's based on the publisher, for instance. Mm -hmm. So if somebody asks for the right to be forgotten. And that publisher then has to send that information uh, and that request over to their third party processors who are also maybe controllers themselves. Um, they're not, the data isn't organized by publisher. It's just mm. in their identity graph. So then they have to drop it regardless of where it came from. 
And so that can get really tricky because they, they rely on that data so heavily for their own profitability. Tim, what's your view? Well, I think we're moving into a world where third-party data will become a bad word or will at least have a negative connotation to it. I think if you look at GDPR, what it really means and why it was designed is that putting the consumer in control of his personal data. The tricky thing is that personal data for the first time also means cookie uh, IDs and IP addresses, mm -hmm. which are commonly used to determine what city you're in, what country you're in. And there's not a single DSP who will bid on an impression if the cookie ID isn't present. So that kind of makes it complex. So we're moving to a world where first party basically, just like Facebook and Google, like you already mentioned, is, is very valuable. And local publishers, local news outlets or video outlets, they don't really have good monetization based on their first party data. They have a lot of behavioral data, but not really good demographic data sets. And that's what you can actually acquire very easy within a Google and a Facebook. So the basic, let's say the recipe is already there and the logged in experience, which you refer to, I don't think we can have a commercial internet anymore where we not make ourselves known. Interesting. So John, black and white view from a, from a legal perspective, what's your, what's your thought on that? Uh, I mean, I think I, I sort of agree with both Stace and Tim. I think that the, but I think the, the starting point is going to be that it's going to be a lot easier for Facebook and to work within a Facebook and Google environment to start off with. I mean, they have a lot of distance to travel to get to compliance, mm. but once they have, it's going to be easy for people to be within that environment and know that the first party data is compliant and therefore to move to, uh, and I agree with Tim that you know there are other groups working with first-party data or trying to build first-party data on a on a on a different scale, but that they are going to have to be running quite hard to catch up. So I think I think the overall view is that this is going to be easier for get Google and Facebook. And we wrote we a little plug we we have a blog called Ad Tekker T E K R. And we wrote a piece about this back in the beginning of the year. And, and, and I think that our view remains pretty much that that's the case. Yeah, although by the sheer nature of the scale of their data processing, they're still going to have a lot to do. It's going oh, to they're going to have a huge exercise mm -hmm. to kind of clean, clean up their, their app. But, the, but they're already moving towards more... They're already very heavily engaged mm -hmm. in it. And you know, they know that if they don't hit the deadline... There are people queuing target, up, queuing yeah. up to beat them up about it. So, but let, I mean, is is one of the winners here um, uh, technology in the sense that there are, there are a lot of solutions out there. Um, so, are, are <coughs> solutions like blockchain technology, you know, a, a, a viable approach from a, from a GDPR? I'm sure you guys are looking at it from a more of a commercial point of view as well. But is GDPR a key no. driver? It was a means to an end, basically, because it, it, we didn't set out to be like we're going to be a blockchain company. Like last year, I, I visited the event, or it was two years ago, and by mistake, I ended up in the wrong building. There was a blockchain event there, so and I heard all these people speaking, and like the rest is history. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and they were speaking about smart contracts, and I was thinking like that, that's kind of like a line item in a DSP, right? So it, it has similar functionality. So we didn't set out to be that, but when you think about it, like if you're going to build a massive first part, if like think about it, you're going to put consumers in control of their data. The last thing you want is to have another central uh, uh, company owning all the data. So then you, you're very quickly coming into a decentralized world where no one owns the data, but everyone, every, it's nurtured and everyone can use it. Well, and that's where blockchain comes into play. That, it facilitates exactly that. And on top of that, everything's auditable. So I think when we're speaking about identity, when we're speaking about media and, and advertising, I, trust is a very... I would say important issue, mm -hmm. which is can be immediately solved this way. Stacey? Yeah, so blockchain has a really um, a really bad cold <coughs> start problem, which um, makes it a tricky solution. But the internet also had a cold start problem, mm -hmm. so um, it's not impossible. But it is also something that requires a network effect. So I see GDPR as the beginning of that network effect because you need to have some kind of downward pressure to get people to think about um, something like a decentralized chain of custody on do, data. Do you mean network effect? Do you mean by 
by that, do you mean a shift in consumer behavior? No, it's more shifting uh, business behavior in their overall processing of mm. data by hashing it to a, a ledger that is okay. auditable. Um, that's, that's just a different way of looking at it. It's, um, you know, um, when I speak about blockchain technology as a chain of custody for data, it's a permissioned, encrypted uh, database, which is yeah. really what uh, blockchain is. And so, um, you know, the solve that Madhive, along with AdLedger, has been working on and is in the midst of, of uh, working on a proof of concept and a privacy impact assessment is, is really um, creating an overall chain of custody um, or digital rights management for, for data sets. So, but John, you, you rose between two thorns, two competitors. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, what, what's your view on this? I mean, do, doesn't this need a shift, a massive shift in consumer behavior? People are used to, you know, accessing content for, for, for free or ad funded free or, or paying very little for it. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I think uh, as I, if I understand what Stacey was saying correctly, then what she's saying is effectively the 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 consent type process is then locked in mm -hmm. to uh, because it, there is a problem which is if I give you know, there's the problem which is why Google and Facebook have the start point is it is if I tick a consent with Google then mm -hmm. they can deliver the entire value chain mm -hmm. against that consent if I log in with the Guardian and then the Guardian is working with, I don't know, Pangea on a sell side, and then there's a couple more middlemen, and there's a DSP, and you get to, to an agency at the other end. For, for my consent to the Guardian to vote, you know, at the point the person bidding on it at the other end is, how do, how do I know that consent is valid? Then I can see that blockchain is a potential solution to... Mm -hmm. To authenticating that con consent down the value chain. It's mm. not just about. But it's not. But it's not. Uh, but I see. But it actually deals with a whole bunch of the other issues that we have in the digital advertising value chain as well, because it deals with the with the transparency problem. It deals with the. Large there's an incentive problem. There, there's a large incentive problem. Like, why would a consumer consent to I don't know Google or Nexus or whatever platform out there? There is absolutely no incentive for them to do that, only reading the content. And then, so as a publisher, you're going to have to put some sort of restriction on consuming content, or you're going to have to grade it at several levels. So there is an incentive for uh, you to share your consent with the Telegraph, because they, or the Guardian or whatever, because they give you content. And instead of being inexplicitly the product on the page, you're being monetized, now you're part of that uh, transaction. So why not also reward you for it? Like, why not save points to, <coughs> I don't know, spend on, on more premium content? And that can be easily achieved with cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I say easily, I really over <laughs> right. But, but we, do, we do consent to Google. So we do, yeah, well, I, we I, do I, consent to I mean, Facebook. Let's say double click. We consent okay. to Google, we consent to Google Maps, to Gmail, to Facebook. You don't even get on Facebook if you don't first share your personal data. Sharing it with double click is a completely different other. It's a completely different story. So the complexity of the supply chain is not transparent to the user, and mm -hmm. therefore they may not consent to. Yeah. To that. So I feel like some of, of, of that idea of the consumer controlling the data is a little is moving a little bit towards the potential e privacy regulations, whereas GDPR well, yeah. is really an opt out scenario, mm -hmm. not really an opt in. So you have the the right to be forgotten. You have the right to access and. You know, Article 17 is the right to be forgotten. So you have to be able to store data in a way that is compliant, meaning you have to organize your databases in order to store the data at the moment of capture. What's, what do you intend to do with it? What's the country of origin? Mm -hmm. um, all of that information. So that's GDPR. And then also if they say stop processing the data, you have to inform all of your third party partners, other controllers and processors that, that that information can no longer be used. So you need to create some kind of a chain of custody to do that. So this is GDPR. And that's sort of like, it's almost like blockchain light. There's not a very heavy consensus algorithm involved. It's simply just creating a very simple chain of custody so that you can track the usage and revoke cryptographic keys when, when the need arises. Mm -hmm. And that's almost like you have to learn how to crawl before you can run. You have to take steps along the way. And this is a very um, classic blockchain use case for 
overall supply chain management. Um, so it's it's a very simple way to to tick all the boxes. And I actually met with a GDPR lawyer yesterday who went through um, the overall protocol that Adledger is vetting and said, absolutely, checks checks all the boxes and also has an added benefit of potentially laying the groundwork and the pipes for e-privacy if that does come into effect. So that's that's most exciting uh, so, offering. So we'll come back to e-privacy e regulation because mm -hmm. that's another complexity that um, I'm sure will, will baffle people. Um, did you say that you thought that GDPR was more of an opt-out opt environment. I, that's the way I John, see it. John, what's what's your view uh, on that? Because I don't think people really take it that way. No, I was I was going to say I think I think that it it's a it's a an opt-in it's largely an opt-in process. Although there there are still scenarios where that can be a soft opt-in. Mm, that's um, more for governments or not really for media companies. Not well. Not really for media companies, but for, you know, you can still get away with a soft, soft opt-in for, uh, you know, I just bought this on Amazon, wouldn't you like, an Amazon then trying to persuade me to buy something else. Yeah, okay, but then there's a commercial transaction already between you and it. Yeah. Yeah. And but what about legacy data, like the data that's already in there? Well, first of all, not all data is personal, so we look at data a bit differently. Like when we talk about GDPR, we tend to speak about all data we have we need to be compliant. But if you look at, I don't know, let's take a single impression, whether it's a video or outside, there are like 80 to 100 uh, characteristics attached to it. They're all stored nicely in the database. Only if you look at it, only four of those, uh, only four of those are considered personal data. It's a cookie ID, the IP address, the mm -hmm. long coordinates and truncated IP address. So if you remove those, or you can encrypt those separate from the rest, what remains, the legacy data, is not really at risk. Right, but you still have to organize your database in a way that requires them uh, That doesn't access. change, sorry, I'm not disputing that, but I'm just saying like, not everything is personal data, and you do need to give consent as a consumer, but a lot of the data that we hold valuable isn't necessarily personal data. So what happens if somebody says, forget me, but yet you collected that user's information years before GDPR oh. went into effect. The right to be forgotten is actually uh, like uh, mitigated to set of property to the right to erasure. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, a less heavy form. And it's re with regards to personal data, not all data. Because if you can no longer relate what the CPM was that was paid, that's not a personal data. Sure. That's not personal data. But you, d you do have to delete those four uh, specific right. things. Mm -hmm. um, but it, Maybe maybe continue the conversation over a cup of tea later. <laughs> um, so do we have an opportunity to... Yeah, so I, I want to open it up because I think... And I don't want questions like, what do I do to comply? That kind of question. I want, you know, some serious questions. And if you can say who you are and where you're from, that would be great. There's a mic here. Matthew, you're nice and easy at the front. You're on stage, so I'm not going to spend too many times. I ju just want very, very Can you specific. say who you are? Yes, and where you're I'm, from I'm Matthew Roche. I'm the founder of ID5. Uh, st stick around. I'm at, on stage at 3:50, I think. <laughs> um, uh, question about plus uh, or minus 20 minutes. Plus or minus 20 minutes, depending <laughs> on how many questions. Um, question about the fact that what I understand from um, the, 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 G the definitions in GDPR is the fact that you are, you cannot refuse access to a service or a product if the data subject doesn't agree to the consent to usage of his personal data. Is this something that I totally invented or, or is there somewhere something written about the fact that and, and, and uh, if, if, if I don't consent, I st I'm still supposed to have access to the service that you're offering? Yeah, that, Which I think, I think, I think is what triggered the, the big article that, that uh, my, yeah, my phone dropped. Uh, big article that the, the, the IAB US boss uh, wrote uh, a few weeks right. ago saying that this is going to destroy the media business model, basically. I think that's more of a proposal from the privacy regulation, but uh, John, yeah. maybe... I, I, I mean, I think... Yes, I think that, that is... I, I think that's effectively what is potentially going to come out of the privacy regulation. I think, I think that, that there is probably a nuance there, which is that, you know can I discriminate between two different suppliers? You know, can I say, okay, if you, if you do not want to access the adverts or to share that data, that's fine. You can still access it, but there's a different price. So um, if you look at something like 
the ITV Hub, ITV Hub delivers adverts to most people, to about three and a half people. That there is a Hub Plus where uh, you pay pay a monthly fee and you get your ITV ad free. Well, okay. Uh, that, but otherwise you're effectively opting into taking those ads. So I, I, I don't think that the GDPR will f impact that, um, but the privacy regulation directive. But that doesn't that doesn't mean. Be. Sorry, I'm going to let the other no, speak. Okay. So but it doesn't mean that a publisher could deliver a gradient service. So it could say you know lower villa video quality or something like that. I, I imagine that might be an I option under GDPR, yeah. but I expect under e privacy regulation it's... Yeah, but you can also grade content in different yeah. ways, like premium content, like snackable, or you don't have to give away everything. As long as there's a choice, I either share my data and accept advertising, I can also pay for the content. Yeah. Stacy, do you want to... Yeah, the worst, I mean, for me, the worst case scenario for e-privacy is if the browser is controlling yeah. it. If, it. if we create some kind of a whitelist environment, that would be the worst case scenario for, for all publishers, because then it's just way too much control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yes. Sorry, I have a bit of a journey. Thanks. Um, my name is Neve McElhatton. I'm the Director of Digital Education at Smart NI. Um, do you really think we could ever get our be forgotten online now, like our digital footprint be gone? Like, how difficult would that be? There's a fantastic Onion cartoon, if you've never seen <laughs> it, um, which involves the person going to the... Um, op uh, uh, opting out of Google, effectively being sent to a small village under a mountain somewhere. Um, and it's worth a look. It's actually quite funny. Uh, short, uh, where, where would we find that? Uh, on the Onion. Oh, sorry, on the Onion. OK. Um, is that, a, is, that an, is that a dog? That, I, all I, mean, I think, I think and your answer to the question? And my answer. <laughs> uh, uh, and my answer. My answer to the question. Are we is, totally going to be forgotten on the, online if we want to be? No, I, I think the the, rea the reality is that there are going to be there is almost no one who will be willing to accept the lack of functionality that w is likely to be the outcome of you know not willing to share your data with Google or Facebook. I, I think the rea that's the reality of it. But, yeah. yeah, and maybe for commercial companies, yes, but from a government perspective, no. Stacey? What, oh, do you want me to answer that question? Yeah, yeah, you, 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 have, do. you have the floor. Um, I completely agree with what was said here. No, I don't think that's possible. There's too much anonymized data already out there as well. But I mean, uh, yes, you could get rid of personalized data, but there's, there's enough information where they can figure stuff out about it. But I took, I took lots of pictures of my kids when they were little and shared them with my friends on Facebook. Um, when they get to the age, I don't know what it is, 16, whatever, can they decide... You know, I don't like what Dad shared, and get rid of it. I mean, is that is that that's a feasible? That's a really interesting question because who owns that picture? You right. or them? Or yeah, is it their image rights? Or it's a very complicated answer. Okay, so the answer is we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> who who wants to ask ask another question? Yes. Do you want to wait for the mic or oh, somebody else? Or shout like? Yeah. Somebody else has got the mic. Okay, so what if I group all my data? Do you want to say who you are and where yeah, you're from? I'm uh, Marco Klutz. I'm the CEO of uh, Platform 161. It's a DSP. So what if I group all my data in, let's say, buckets of 265 users? Uh, would, be, would I then completely evade, so to speak, GDPR? Or what's your idea about it? <laughs> Sounds like another one for the lawyer. <laughs> John? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, listen, I, I think that the, the reality is that European legislation is very <coughs> purpose. Uh, it, it tends to be interpreted very purposively and not based on the absolute last wording, uh, particularly when it goes to the European court. That's why one or two people in this country seem to not like the European court. Um, but the, the reality is that 
the when where the legislation says do X and people find a clever way of not quite doing X, then the European Court usually goes and fills in the gap. So I, I'm I'm very skeptical of going. Aha, well, uh, and actually one example is if you look at the language of the 4% fines, it doesn't specifically say, uh, you know, it says, aha, I'm going to have, I'm going to set up a company called Google Data A to, a to Z, you know, a, a to C and then D to F and have them in separate companies. So I can only ever get fined the turnover of the individual company. Well, actually on the technical wording you might get away with that because it doesn't actually talk about group turnover in the same way as the well, it depends on the area of non-compliance no, i think what you mean is different more technical uh, technically right so if you don't uh, if you don't treat people person if you don't personalize their experience if you only personalize them per 256 uh, okay which is yeah, kind of like yeah. if you remove one of the octets from an ip address yeah, you yeah, hold yeah. the group that remains is 256 people right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah no <laughs> <laughs> the answer's still no. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more, any more the questions? The There's a Question lady the right in the middle there. Oh. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, my name's Ottilie. I'm the, I run the marketing at Venetus. And my question, if we were talking about supply chains, and I just wondered how much responsibility should we expect to have for our partners? <coughs> Okay. I mean, as I, as I was told, that w the um, onus is on the controller to notify partners that you've shared that data with. Um, and so the way that, you know, there's a protocol that is going to be released as an open source project in January um, through AdLedger and th through a series of web hooks, you can actually call the partner and, you know, the reply that comes from the partner that they've been notified is actually hashed as a digital signature on a blockchain. So that's an example of compliance, right? So you as a controller, you sent, you called up the series of webhooks from your data partners, and they re reply with their SSL certificate that they did, in fact, hear the message, and that is considered compliance, and that can be audited by the EU uh, by querying that blockchain. So that's an example of, you know, as I understand it, legal compliance is notifying them. Well, I, I think there are different compliance at different points. <coughs> yeah. At the point you decide to work with a particular supplier, then you, you are at risk if that supplier's, for example, security processes are mm. not sufficiently robust. So you need to take a view as to how you are going to manage that risk. So what we are seeing is a lot, a lot more you know, contractual checklists, questionnaires, supplier questionnaires. So if you, you're, so, so that you want to start now making sure that the people you are working with understand the obligations you are going to be pushing down onto them, because ultimately if they screw up, then the, the buck is going to stop with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it will stop with them to a greater degree now than it did as well, but it will ultimately still stop with the data controller. Yeah, that's an important qualifying piece that your partners also have to, in this instance, also comply with the same protocol that you are. If that if that overall blockchain protocol were to work, your partners have to comply with that the way they process data as well. But the the pro data processor is still liable. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they may be relying on a publisher, for example, to do things, but they're still going to be liable. Yeah, so so the so the the you know the need to have that contractual relationship right works from both ends, right. in, in the sense that the the processor wants to make sure that it can rely upon the integrity of the data it's getting from the publisher, for example. They would still go after the publisher. That's what you're. Well, no, um, data processors have liabilities under the GDPR. We're getting really yeah. complex here. I quite <laughs> like it actually. Um, they have they have liabilities and obligations under the under under existing law. It's the buck mm -hmm. stops with the data controller. Is that right? Yeah. Under under the existing law, if yeah, the the only person effectively who is responsible is the data controller. And if you give somebody else and the give data us give us an process. example of a data controller and a data processor for because we're using GDPR language. That um, okay, I'm a publisher. I I I I've collected first party data. I've got the consent. Yeah. Um, and I give it to my um, to a to to a sell side platform in order for them to 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 monetize that impression, 
then if the sell side platform has a data leak and that information, you know, they do an Equifax, <coughs> then, then actually that's my problem as the publisher. Whereas in the future, it will still be my publish problem as the publisher, but the, the data processor <coughs> has a de greater degree of, of you know, parallel responsibility, if you like. Yeah, because I think what, that's one of the challenges is that, especially in a complex supply chain like ab, ab digital advertising, you're going to have, you're, a business could go from being a controller to a processor to a controller to a processor. Yeah. All the way through. But let's not get into that complexity. So have we got time for, for any more questions? Um, I think I'm giving you time. We should. Uh, we're obviously getting too complex. So um, I'm, feeling sorry. <laughs> I'm feeling sorry for the man who's been holding for the mic for like oh. three or four can, can questions. We give, can you give him the opportunity? Go on. <clears throat> I forgot my question now. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Name. So, um, uh, given that not many people want, who, who are you? Sorry, I'm oh, sorry. I'm uh, Clive Page from Group M. Uh, given that nobody or not many people want this type of regulation or legislation, uh, it sounds like, and you could argue that it's born of lobbying. And given that lobbying is quite an expensive uh, practice and takes some deep pockets. Who, who is paying for the lobbying? So who is the driving force behind this? Right, let's end the panel session. <laughs> <laughs> who are, Tim, Tim, well, very quickly, 30 seconds. There's quite a lot of assumptions there. Um, yeah. But the Article 29 Working Group, I wouldn't call them lobbyists per se. I would call them more fundamentalists about what happens to yeah. privacy. Mm. Yeah. Not, I don't believe in a lobby. Okay, John? Well, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think, I think that you underestimate the power of, uh, in Europe, uh, BIRC, the consumer's representative body, are quite an effective lobby. So, so I think it's a combination of the Article 29 working group and the, and the regulators speaking as the self-appointed voice of the consumer and the consumer lobby, the BIRC, again, the arguably self-appointed uh, voice of the consumers would be my, would be my where, where I would put the thing. Okay, Stacey, just you can answer this question or you can have a, another final word if you want. <laughs> well, I, Sorry, don't think guys, it, you I don't think it has anything to do with any like commercial, there's no commercial gain for any specific company if that's sort of what you were, what you were um, leaning towards. I, I do agree, I think it's just fundamentalism in terms of overall uh, privacy control. But, um, you know. But you're the same, you're seeing to a lesser degree similar moves in the states through a combination of class actions and mm. FTC activity. So, so although there is this kind of Europe, Europe is doing it through a legislative route, the, the sort of privacy agenda is being pushed in the states. It's just using different tools and implements. Would that be fair? And not as aggressively. Was I, I, I know we, we, it's bad to end on a question, but I think, <laughs> I think we ought to wrap it up. I hope that's enlightened you a little bit about the GDPR and some of your questions. But thanks to Tim, John, and Stacey. Give them a round of applause. Thank you very much.